I'm going to interview a friend of mine. I'm super, super excited to bring her up. She is the head of the Center of Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College here in New York. She wrote, I'm sorry, she edited this incredible book called Aftershocks of Disaster. She's a professor, she's a contributor to New York Times. She's an expert on all things Puerto Rican and New York. It's really a, an honor to have her. You guys are gonna love her. Please help me welcome Yarimar Bonilla, everybody. <laughs> This necklace special for you. For what does it say? Nueva York. Ah, look at that, <laughs> Nueva York. That means New York. <laughs> I don't know if you guys knew that. Great. Well, welcome to the welcome to the show. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here. I got look at that. I got a picture of you there, and that's me listening. Well, huh? Yeah, I'm really good with graphics. No big deal. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started. I'll ask you some questions. This isn't this ain't your grandma's interview show. Okay, these are hard hitting questions. All right. So we'll get started. Um, let me see. Let me check my little card here. <laughs> you know. All right. <clears throat> How are you? Um, good. I'm good. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Um, okay, so you're an expert on Puerto Rico. So we were talking a little bit about this earlier on when I was mentioning Williamsburg. And I talked about how it's a, it's a kind of a special case where you have migrants because they're technically part of the United States. I, I was hoping you could expound on this difference between immigrants from other countries and to immigrants, immigrants, for lack of a better term, from Puerto Rico? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people like to act very, uh, well, actually, Puerto Ricans are not immigrants. Yeah. They're migrants uh, because they are citizens, right? But then there's other people who say, well, we have an immigrant experience, though, you know? So we're actually, we are kind of like immigrants. I've gotten right? comments on my videos from people <laughs> like that, <laughs> a lot of mean comments. <laughs> I'm sensitive, okay, sorry. I know, we, we all are, yeah. yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Puerto Ricans since 1917 mm -hmm. have been citizens of this great empire <laughs> that we belong to. And so before that, there was a short period where we were citizens of no place, right? Because we were originally part of a Spanish empire, part of you know the Spanish colonial empire. And mm -hmm. then we were transferred over to the US as booty of war. I always like to say that just because I like to say booty. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you then, don't grow out of some things, guys. Remember no, that. No, no. Yep. Even as a college professor. That's right. That's right. And uh, and then for a short while, we were uh, non-citizen nationals of mm -hmm. the U.S. But then in 1917, conveniently, so that we could participate in the draft, we did become citizens. Mm -hmm. Look at that. And then and then in the mid 1900s, it switches to what is I guess some people call the Commonwealth. Yes. But yes. I guess it's a little more technical than that. Yes, well, uh, in, in Spanish it's called Estado Libre Asociado, mm -hmm. Free Associate State, but the joke is that we're not free, we're not associated, and we're not a state. <laughs> <laughs> nice, what a nice deal that is, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's great when, you know, your title does not reflect in any way what you actually are. It's right. really useful. So all of these technical differences, I guess, with, with, I guess, the situation of Puerto Rico, how does that reflect itself on the actual experience of the, quote, migrant or the immigrant? Well, you know, I always like to remind my students that Puerto Ricans have been coming to the U.S. before we even were part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. The first Puerto Rican immigrants that came here were during the era of Spanish colonization, and it was here in New York that the Puerto Rican flag was invented. On, oh, I don't know if that. invented is the right term. Imagined, designed, right? On 23rd Street, not far. I actually did not <laughs> know that. Thank you for teaching me that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, inspired by the Cuban flag. Sure. Right, because in, in that time, Puerto Ricans and Cubans mm -hmm. were part of the Spanish colony and were fighting together for their independence. And it was here in New York that it was a hotbed of anti-colonial mm -hmm. activism um, for these neighboring, Ameri you know, a part of the Americas, uh, uh, anti-colonial activists. Yep. And so that was the very first wave of migration that brought folks like Arturo Schomburg, mm -hmm. who is now a very common n name in, yeah. in, in New York, right? The Schomburg Center in Harlem, if you guys don't know, it's like one of the largest uh, collections of African-American literature and exhibit. It's, it's an incredible place. You should check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the, the deep roots of, of the Puerto Rican presence um, in New York, long before J-Lo. We, we had Schomburg. <laughs> And what year was JLo president of Puerto Rico, governor of Puerto Rico? I'll uh, have to check off to yeah. get back to you. Uh, okay, cool. And and so uh, what I what I guess interests me a lot is that it it uh, a, as a Puerto Rican, you 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 have that kind of traveling that you guys call them migrants, but you also have a different experience from let's say a Nicaraguan or someone who comes from a quote country of their own who has a national identity that they bring with them. 
and you're almost in kind of like a limbo in a way. Um, and I thought in this book was very interesting. You talk about how one of the ways that uh, Puerto Ricans assert their nationality is through culture. So music is so important and all these different things that they really latch on to because they don't have those things. But other, what other ways would you say that Puerto Ricans, I guess, uh, experience that kind of, uh, that, uh, that I guess, that the, the movement or the migration differently? Well, I think, you know, people who come from other countries, mm -hmm. um, Nicaragua, for example, yeah, sure. um, there's still a homeland that you can imagine, that you can, you know, be proud of and assert, right? But Puerto Ricans sometimes feel some kind of way about the fact that we don't have a homeland, right? What we have is a kind of co colony, you know, colonial territory the U.S. considers as a territory and we're the the federal office that is in charge of Puerto Rico is the Office of Natural Resources. We are a resource, right, to, mm -hmm. to right. the U.S. Empire, and yeah, so so and sometimes yeah. for for a lot of activists growing up in in New York in, in the seventies, etc., there was this kind of shame of being Puerto Rican, and so at the same time that you had the kind of Black is Beautiful kind of you know movements to reclaim you know the power of that identity. Similarly, Puerto Rican activists were creating organizations like the Young Lord mm -hmm. or creating cultural institutions like the New York Poets Cafe and right here in Loisaida, right? Lo Lo Lower East yeah. Side, Loisaida, yeah. right, for a lot of Puerto Ricans. And asserting and finding power and beauty in that identity rather than feeling a, a sense of shame for being a colonial subject, right? Yeah. And asserting the language that they were often told not to speak because that's why right. Puerto Ricans were sometimes called spics because they didn't speak English, right? And so asserting the beauty of Spanish, asserting the beauty of being connected to that homeland and of owning that identity rather than trying to assimilate into an American culture that, that didn't really have a place for them. Right, and I think it's interesting you bring up the uh, New York Poets Cafe. So the, the Poets Cafe was actually started, in like, it was like a group of people who basically were artists and they wanted to basically practice their art, but they, weren't, they were locked out of the other avenues, Broadway, theaters that didn't let them in, so they basically started their own thing in someone's apartment. And then it eventually got to be an actual cafe and actually brick and mortar. But what I think is interesting about that too is that uh, you talk, it, 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 it hit on it in this book as well, where the idea, okay, so you're, quote, citizens of the United States, but you're not. You're still, you're kind of a second-class citizen. So, you know, it, it, when it's convenient, you're a citizen, and when it's not convenient, you're not. And I think that's got to also mess with your head as well, in that you're kind of, once again, in this limbo, and your, your title is one thing, and the way you're treated is another thing. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, that, like you said, the New Yorican is a, and I remember there was a line in the book where, where one of the writers is saying that there's a, there's a quote that citizenship is a trap uh, sometimes. And I guess I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, I think that came up a lot. At, you know, the book is talking about media discourses mm -hmm. around Hurricane Maria. And so when people would be very outraged and say, but these are Puerto Rican citizens. And so, you know, part of the, you know, the challenge that the writer in the book is saying, first of all, well, even if we weren't citizens, like if we were Dominicans right. or, you know, from another neighboring country, do we not deserve aid? Is it only this passport that we didn't even choose that, that you know, entitles us to assistance in the wake of a natural disaster, right? Um, and then there's also the fact that there's been a long struggle for uh, within, you know, Puerto Rican society to gain independence. And, you know, Puerto Ricans, you know, were involved in, in a certain level of even armed struggle. They shot up the White House, they shot up uh, the Senate. And there was a strong political movement that was repressed by the US government. And so the fact that that history is also denied and not something that we can find pride in, you know, when it was it was here in New York that a lot of that organizing yeah. was happening for the Grito de Lares and for these other political movements. So I think that that citizenship sometimes, you know, we, we, you know I, I've written also about like sometimes when I show my US passport at customs, it kind of, my hand shakes a little bit, because it's like, well, yeah, and, and this is a useful little thing to have that lets me not just into the United States, but into a ton of nations in the world without a visa, right? It gives me this mobility and all of that, but, but do I feel a sense of being estadounidense? Not necessarily, right? Not necessarily. And so, and I have a friend who says, we're not, we're not citizens, we are colonial subjects with a passport. Right. right? Right, and that goes to the issue, I guess, of sovereignty. You know, because uh, like you were saying, like using Nicaragua as an example, like, yeah, you're, you know, you're coming from another country and with its problems, whatever, you still have whatever say you may have in that country. In Puerto Rico, it's understood that everything there goes beneath 
U.S. Congress, the U.S. government, even the governor, everyone there is kind of beholden to the decisions. It's got to be rubber stamped by the United States. They don't, they ha they don't have a congressperson. Everything has to be approved. You know, there have been Supreme Court cases that have delineated this exactly. And I guess that, that's got to be, a, you know, I guess also kind of a tough thing to deal with because you don't have sovereignty. You don't have, the, you don't have agency. Yeah, and for, for a long time the U.S. said that, that, that Puerto Rico had been decolonized. Part of why the Commonwealth, Estado Libre Asociado, was created was to take Puerto Rico off the list of non-self-governing nations in the U.N. so that the United States no longer had to report on this colony, right? And so it's like, oh, you're decolonized. Yeah, yay. But then in 2016, right, right before Hurricane Maria, and this all kind of created a real political moment in Puerto Rico, uh, there was a bankruptcy case. Puerto Rico was trying to file for bankruptcy, and the U.S. said, oh, no, actually, no, you, you, we were joking. No, you, you don't really have sovereignty, no, no. That we were playing, you know. So yeah. uh, and I think those, that's a direct quote, actually, too, as well. It, it almost yeah. is. It's a it direct almost quote from is. the U.S. government. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, and that even at the time, they had said, "Well, you know, we're just gonna s pretend that this is really a form of decolonization." But I'll, we all know that Congress decides, right? And so there's also at this point, after like you know, our movements for independence were repressed and dismantled after our economy was completely yeah. turned into, a, a, you know, something that serves U.S. interests right. rather than our interests. You know, our agriculture, our agricultural economy was decimated. We import 80% of our right. food from the U.S. You know, we've been really m turned into a dependent colony yeah. of the U.S. Um, so some people are now saying, well, well, maybe we should be a state then. Okay, right. then give us that full citizenship instead of this like sometimes we qualify but sometimes we don't and we can't have certain entitlements we don't have medicare we don't have full social security puerto rican veterans who fight disproportionately in the armed forces don't have the same rights and then the u.s is like oh statehood yikes oh right. no that that was never meant for you actually and the welfare benefits are less all these different things that yeah. regular states disability get. insurance disability, yeah. all these things are are much much less in puerto rico and in the virgin islands and in guam and in samoa because it's also important to remember that the U.S. is an empire. It's not just that Puerto Rico is a kind of oopsie. It's part of this larger system um, that's kept hidden and kept silenced. Mm -hmm. And so in those moments when people are like, ooh, right, we, we own, the U.S. owns Puerto Rico, right? People yeah. seem to forget. I mean, literally Trump was like, wait, do we own it? Can we sell it? <laughs> <laughs> Put a golf course there? What's going on? Well, you know, um, that it's interesting you bring that up too because you're talking about the agriculture. That's one of the reasons why so many immigrants came here because was that shift in the economy. Our immigrants, I hate to say it, sorry, but, but so many people came to the to mainland U.S. Uh, was because of that shift in the agriculture. They're the mono, you know, the mono agriculture, just a couple of crops as opposed to being able to sustain and do all kinds of different crops and feed everybody, et cetera. Just you no know, pump out coffee or pump out this, and that's it. You're just supplying this thing. And then as it shifted to industries, people went to the cities, there was not enough work because the, they didn't have enough. And then people were like, well, we gotta go somewhere. So in the mid 1900s, a lot of people came to, to New York to find that there were no jobs here either. Uh, so it, I guess that's one of the reasons why people came and also why so many of the Puerto Ricans here were put in the situation they were put in as well. Yeah. You know what borough received the most number of Puerto Rican immigrants originally? Originally, no, which one? Red Hook. I mean, that's not Burroughs. Oh, neighborhood. neighborhood. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> I was like, Red Hook's a borough? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my bad. Neighborhood, yeah, neighborhood. Sure, sure. Yeah, I so that, that. yeah, yeah, because that's where the ships would come. Sure, in. yeah, yeah. It was yeah, an industry. Yeah, and we should we should do a tour of of. I've been wanting to do a Nueva York tour. Let's do it. Yeah. All right, guys, let's go. Come on, everybody, let's do it. Let's walk around. Because you go to any neighborhood in, yeah. in New York, and it's like, oh, this used to be lousy with Puerto Ricans, yeah. you know? And you're like, yeah. like the Lower East Side, like yeah. Williamsburg, like Red Hook, East Harlem. And, and there would be like a way of telling the story of New York through the story of Puerto Rican mi migrants or immigrants, yep. both, because we've had both at yep. different moments, um, and the different ways in which we've been displaced and pushed around uh, yeah. the city and then you'll you know you'll be walking around Williamsburg seeing the hipsters on their bikes buying you know specialty mayonnaise or something <laughs> and then there'll be like some served out of a trombone on a, on a roller skate or whatever yeah that's the best yeah. way to eat it sure really. yeah of course yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and then there'll be like two viejitos playing dominoes on yeah. a corner and you'll be like how did they end up here you know right. and it's, they're lost they, <laughs> they, they, they had some rent control or something yeah, man, right <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, it's funny you say that because I think that's an important point. I think uh, one of the reasons why I love studying New York history so much is that through studying New York history, you're really studying the world history. 
Because whatever has happened in the world in the last 400 years has passed through here. I mean, we already talked about Cuba, and you talked about you know Puerto Rico and these different movements happening. It passed through here. You know, you talk about we talk about the Jewish you know immigration to Williamsburg, all these different things, all pass through here because of what's going on in the world. So just by studying New York history, you're studying world history. You know, for the last 400 years at least. Uh, but I think that's a good example. Uh, I you know I I, I guess you want to get to another thing here. This is very important. Yari, I want to move on to the another, another little segment we have here. This is a, uh, we've been, we've been, we solved all issues already. We've solved every issue here in New York already. So let's move to something a little lighter here. I want to move to a little thing we call rapid fire questions here. Huh? Look at this. Oh, rapid fire. Gotta, oh, no. Setting our faces on fire. Oh, no. <laughs> all right. So this is where I'm going to ask you some more, uh, I guess, stuff about New York. Because you, how long have you been in New York? Uh, about 12 years. 12 years, 12 right? Years. And you like it here? Okay. Yeah. Well, those aren't the questions. I was just... Uh, <laughs> I actually got them here written on a card. <laughs> okay, we're going to do some rapid-fire questions. Let's get to know you a little bit. All right, here we go. To you, what person most personifies New York City? Well, I think growing... I grew up in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, New York was New Yorkans. Uh, and for me, it was Rosie Perez. Oh, that's great. That was like, and you know, she made funny voices a thing. So sure, I love her for that. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to do your best Rosie Perez impression? No, but anyone in the audience is welcome to. Billy, what are you doing, Billy? <laughs> that was that was Rosie Perez in White Men Can't Jump. Everybody, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This this isn't about me. Okay. All right. Oh, here we go. <laughs> what is the craziest thing you've ever seen in New York? That's so hard to answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the night is you, young. You could just walk outside. And no, because you, you become desensitized. Yes, I And know. so it's like, is that, is that crazy? No, it's crazy. true. I, I always tell people that in New York, you forget things throughout the span of a day that would make the front page of a small page paper, a small town paper. <laughs> It would make the front page of a small town paper and you just forget them throughout the day. But after that, I never feel more like I'm in New York than when I see someone in the subway carrying something impossible. Then I'm like, how did they get that down there? Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, like a king size mattress. Yeah. And they're like putting it on the A train, you yeah. know? So, but that's just every day, you know? No, that's true. I mean, you, you do that is, uh, that's true. I once saw someone had a love seat on the, on the, on the subway. That's convenient, though. That is convenient, you, like, yeah. just chill in it. Yeah, yeah. sure. And all, either on the subway or on their bike, like, carrying just something gigantic, like, doing an entire, you know, four-family move on a bicycle. <laughs> I've, I've seen this every day. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's not even crazy. So. No, it's not crazy. <laughs> that's not crazy. You guys have that in Toronto, huh? <laughs> kind of. Kind of, yeah. I don't know what neighborhood you live in in Toronto. All right, here we go. We're going to keep moving. Here we go. Let's do it. If you had to live somewhere other than New York City and Puerto Rico. Oh. Nice try, Yari. I saw right through you. I've been doing this for a long time, okay? Where would you live? Um, probably Canada, free healthcare, woohoo. Yeah. Ugh. Free health care. Yes, nice. At least half the year, you know, in the warm months. <laughs> yeah. You definitely have a speed there, Canada. I will yeah. say that. Uh, not to get too depressing. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of our health care system, though, is that when you have health insurance, you pay a lot of money every month, and then when you go to the doctor, you still have to pay. <laughs> what other country has that, huh? I don't think so. All right. What do you think is a good slogan for New York? Well, you were saying before how, like, world history, everything, you know, you, everything comes through here. And that's what I would tell my mom, too. I'm like, I love living in New York. Is any band I want to see? I just pay attention. that comes through here. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's como la cuneta del mundo. It's mm -hmm. like the gutter of the world. Like, just everything pours through here. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And, and, and it's about as clean. <laughs> the gutter of the world. I know a lot of people from Florida that would disagree with you. <laughs> I think you think you got a think your hands full with that. No, you're right. I actually think that's an interesting point too because uh, I, I always I always used to tell people when I when I do tours I would get people who you, who moved away from New York and they'd say things like oh New York's done it's dead or whatever, and I always tell them like look whatever New York is now is gonna get to wherever you're going. Okay, I mean, whatever. I always told New York people that New York is kind of the eye of whatever hurricane is hitting the world at any moment. 
like whether it's you know inequality or what have you, it's kind of doing its worst damage here. Whether like rising rents, all that stuff. You don't think that's going to catch up to every city in the country? It's on its way, but it's all kind of starting here. So you might as well be on the front lines fighting it in New York City. You know, that's the way I see it at least. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. We're all going to be underwater in 50 years. Who am I kidding? All right. No, we're not. All right. Uh, here we go. Let's keep moving. What's the best book you've ever read? The best book, book I ever read. Oh, damn. Yeah. Once again, Gen Zers, a book is just, uh, it's like a paper meme. Okay. All right. Um, but that's, I mean, that's a really hard question to yeah, ask a scholar, is, you know? That is true. So. We get it. You read lots of books. <laughs> I'll move on. No, but, but it's like asking to choose your, your favorite child or something, or your favorite, you know. A Sophie's said. Choice. So I'll just, I'll go with my, my mentor's book, you know. It's called Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History. And it's amazing. It's taught in, like, graduate schools and in, like, prison literacy programs. What's it yeah. called? It? Sorry? Silencing the Past, Silencing Power the past. and the Production of History by Michelle Rolf Trio. Okay. And it, it's about why... We, the Haitian Revolution was silenced as one of the major revolutions in modern history. Mm. Why, like, people couldn't even assimilate what that, what it was, and what it meant for the world, oh, okay. and why they tried to silence it. That sounds interesting. And this is your mentor's yeah. book. Yeah, oh, okay, my great. my favorite quote, or one of them, is like, "One silences history the way you silence a gun." Oh. That's a very nerd. That's a very nerd. Like, oh, that was so Damn. deep. Damn. Yeah. That's good. That's deep. <laughs> That's good. It's your mentor's book, too, so she scored some points with that answer as well. I don't know well, if you're he passed away. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Boy, do I have egg on my face. All right, well, let's keep it moving. Rest in peace. All right, what, uh, what's the worst job you've ever had? You know, I've, I've mostly worked as a professor, but I've also worked at the mall and at a, sh at a shoe store and at a hotel gift shop. But I think the worst job I had was when I had to temp in this office and they didn't really have any work for me to do. So I had to pretend to work so that I wouldn't get fired. So I would just sit at the computer and kind of pretend, but I didn't really have anything to do. And it was the most excruciating thing to have to pretend <laughs> to work. And I, not like, not I couldn't watch, because everyone could right. see my computer screen. So I couldn't like watch YouTube, watch you on YouTube or watch anything. Nice. So, yeah. Pretending to work is weirdly harder than just working. I think you just described 90% of people's jobs in here. <laughs> I think everyone here is like, yeah, that sounds like my job. <laughs> I'm a cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what would be your, what would be your, so we have someone, uh, Aramis was saying you just moved here. You got some people who are probably thinking of moving here. What's your advice to people who move to New York? What's your advice to people about New York, like what they should do or how to get the city, or make their home here? Well, okay, so specifically for people moving to New York, two things. First, finding your first apartment in New York is the most painful, excruciating, uh, panic attack inducing experience of your life. You yeah. will question all life choices, yeah. et cetera. And you will learn that New York City is the place where you cannot have it all. You have to choose. Do you want windows or a bathroom? Like, you can't have them both, you know? Do you want sunlight or an elevator? You know, like, it's just, you have to decide the one thing that really matters to you because you're not gonna get anything else, yeah. All right, I, all I heard was that there is no after party at Yari's house afterwards. <laughs> We're gonna have to find a different spot to go, everybody. Sorry. Wow, yeah, no, I, I agree. Everyone, everyone's first apartment in New York, if you're thinking of moving here, just go ahead and resign yourself. Your first apartment is gonna be a nightmare. It's gonna be a nightmare. I, I lived in it, my first apartment was in uh, Nolita. You're already like, ooh, fancy, but I lived with seven roommates. <laughs> seven roommates, that's right. And Ms. 10 Ms. if Ms. you count studio? the mice. Huh? In the studio? No, you're in the studio. I, no, no, actually not that bad. But none of, the, none of the rooms had windows. None of them had windows, and we got kicked out after two months because, go figure, it was illegal. <laughs> Nobody told me. <laughs> All right. What's that? What's the second thing? The second thing what? Oh, yeah, the second thing. Yeah, oh, the second the, the one that it's like a stress-inducing, gut oh, yeah. experience, and two, nice. that you Good can't call. have it this all. This guy got it. Yeah. He's taking yeah. notes. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, cool. All right, so uh, what's your, what's the, all right. What's the one place in New York, if someone was to come here and be like, all right, I, I got a layover for like 20 minutes, take me to the one place that, that shows New York. What do I need to see? Uh, 20 minutes, maybe longer, whatever, you get it. You get, the, you get the question. What's the one place that personifies to you? I 
guess Central Park. Central Park? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's true. Central Park is a beautiful place. I always tell people, though, for me, it's always Grand Central. Yeah. Only because Central Park is beautiful and it's one of the best places in the world, but Grand Central to me always personifies the beauty, the energy, the diversity, the people running around, that, that, like, that like get out of my way mentality, that you know, everything is so ornate, but also dirty, and you know, it's just kind of everything about New York is right in that place. Um, but Central Park is amazing, actually. Uh, you go there a lot? I, I do, and, but the thing is, every time I go there, I feel like, wow, I live in New York. Yeah. It feels like a movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Everyone in the audience is like, that's how I feel when I come to this show. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. Stop. Okay. I, I thought this would be a really cool question to ask you. Uh, uh, what's your favorite part about being Puerto Rican? Oh, wow. My favorite part about being Puerto Rican, you know, uh, it, when you're in Puerto Rico, everyone acts like they're related, even if they're not. You know, it's like, it's a small island, we're very friendly, and you know, you, you, everyone, you can find some kind of degree of separation, and so when you act like someone could be your family, there's a kindness, there's, you know, there's a solidarity, uh, there's a, a, an affection, you know? And so I think Puerto Ricans, we are very friendly and affectionate and kind and funny to each other. So I like that. Yeah, that actually reminds me of something in uh, the book, actually, that I thought was, was really interesting. There was a chapter called Community Kitchens, and they talk about uh, how you know, it, it's, it's about setting up community kitchens, obviously, and, and the book deals with like post-Hurricane Maria, and there, there's this feeling of hopelessness a lot of times that people feel, and I think people here even feel. It doesn't have to be just Puerto Rico. Or, and, but I think that in, the, in that chapter, they talk about, it says that what, what starting a community kitchen may not solve all the problems of the place all at once, obviously, but it, they said it increases the collective confidence of the people and demonstrates to the people there what is possible. And I think that's kind of the key for anybody who's trying to improve anything. Because I think it's overwhelming when we, we get lost, like, oh, everything's so expensive, you know, the world's falling apart. But if you just kind of focus on your little place and the little change you can make and just kind of stay there a little bit and, and really be present, I think that kind of, you know, will keep you sane and also keep everyone else sane. And, you know, and hopefully, I guess uh, what I'm saying is power trickles up, you know? I think we're always taught that power goes down, but power trickles up. The more we change at our level, it goes up and up and up and up and it eventually changes everything. I but, yeah. think there was a lot of that happening after Hurricane Maria where, you know, folks in Puerto Rico felt really abandoned, yeah. you know, by, by the U.S. And, and eight months without electricity, a lot of interesting things happen when you are eight months without electricity, yeah. right? And a lot of solidarity and getting to know your neighbors and uh, imagining alternative possibilities. And, you know, it's no coincidence that two years later, Puerto Ricans came together, marched in the streets and got rid of the governor uh, for, for corruption and, and, you know, sc scandals around him. Um, and I think that was very much like the revolution that Maria, you know, Hurricane Maria, made possible so who knows what's next <laughs> after after all of that you know that has been happening in Puerto Rico for the last few years yeah and I think you hit the nail on the head I mean any revolution or change in thought really starts with people just coming together period and it period end of story like it, it doesn't have to be you know a plan on the wall or a map or a model of the White House or whatever things change when people just come together and talk and interact and like oh this, things aren't so I think that's a good I think that was a good uh, that's a good so one more thing, I guess, is, is, you know, do you have anything you'd like to say to people here? We're talking about New York. What is your, what is your last thought on New York as a city? We talk Puerto Rico. What do you think about New York? What do, you, what, do you, what do you want people to remember about New York when they leave here? Well, I, w I wouldn't live anywhere else in the United States than in New York because I feel like whoever you are, whatever you're into, wherever you came from, there's a community of that random little niche here, you know? And so everywhere else I've lived in the U.S., people are constantly like, where are you from? Where are you from? Uh, I lived in Virginia, and people are like, where are you from? I'm like, Chicago, and they wouldn't buy it, right? They're like, you, you must be from some foreign land. And I'd be like, no, Chicago. And you're, but your parents, I'm like, Chicago. <laughs> Third generation, <laughs> you know. Just leave already. Yeah. yeah, but but you know, New York. Like, no matter what kind of weirdo you are, yeah. you're at home. You find a place here. You That's know? right. 
we're all weirdos. <laughs> Doesn't that feel nice? There's a liberation in accepting that. It really is liberating to accept that. All right, one more question, the most important question of the night. <sighs> Will you be my friend? I'm gonna have to know what that entails. How, <laughs> how often do we have to hang out? No, you're, I'm kidding, I'm you're kidding. You're very of cynical. Course. Of course, of Awesome, course. I got a new friend. We're already yeah, friends. yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it, was, it was really a pleasure to have you. Guys, give it up for Yadimar Bonilla, everybody. Thank you so much. I'll take the mic. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right, guys. We did it. We made it to the end of the show.